Right, black holes. How do they grow? What do they eat? How much do they eat? These are all questions that we're going to be answering today. Hey all and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be diving deep into black hole growth and looking at two of the main mechanisms that black holes actually feed. Just as a little warning, black hole growth and general generally how black holes eat is probably one of the largest topics within astrophysics. There's just so much to cover with it. You know, you, we've got general relativity, you know, everything about accretion disks and just disks in general and their mechanics. You know, it's just so much to cover. So we won't be able to go through everything. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. But hopefully I can give you a little taster of stuff and I will maybe even put a little bit of maths and physics equations here and there. But don't be scared. I'll be helping you and explaining everything as we go. So the two main mechanisms that black holes actually grow are through the accretion disk, which is, you know, lots of hot matter that, uh, you know, essentially orbits around the black hole itself. I'm sure you've seen many pictures of them. And if I stand over here, actually, I'll stand over here from now on. We've got a nice empty space here that I can put pictures on and equations. So I'll pop up a artist rendition of an accretion disk or actually I might actually put a real one <laughs> instead and then the other topic as well which is just merging so this is when two supermassive black holes merge together uh, this actually is more of a mathematical sort of general relativity gravita gravitational waves kind of subject whereas accretion disks tend to stay more on the sort of Newtonian classical nicer side although it gets it goes from zero to 100 real quick so all supermassive black holes will have an accretion disk of some sort and some size uh, this essentially comes about when you know some matter essentially gets captured by the influence of the black hole and just forms a stable orbit around the supermassive black hole accretion disks are very efficient they're probably the most efficient engines <laughs> we have in the universe with efficiencies roughly around 10 percent but they can actually go up to the i think 42.2 percent is the theoretical maximum so we've just said that you know an accretion disk is formed by matter you know gas being captured by the black hole's influence, but what actually goes on once it's in the accretion disk in order for it to actually release that energy. For an orbit of a specific certain angular momentum, the lowest energy possible for that orbit is a circle. So you might know that a lot of planets have elliptical orbits and that will have, you know, a certain sort of gravitational potential energy associated with it but the lowest energy you can get is actually just a perfect circle which is quite hard with planets but you know when it comes to something really big like a supermassive black hole and a little accretion disk it's actually the matter tends to form a circle itself but once you actually get to that lowest energy state possible the circle the only way you can lose energy further is actually losing angular momentum itself what actually happens then is that the gravity of the supermassive black hole is going to pull this matter further and further in which will liberate it from its angular momentum we'll get to that in a second and then as a result that you know, that generated radiation that we just talked about earlier is actually going to produce an outward pressure on the disk itself. So gravity actually drives the acceleration and pulls in the actual matter from the disk itself. And as a result, it loses angular momentum. And also we generate an outward pressure, radiation pressure, which actually counteracts gravity itself. There is a critical point at which the gravity pulling in the matter itself balances the radiation pressure. And once actually the pressure gets above that, accretion shuts off. And we call this limit the Eddington limit. The Eddington limit and other properties like the Edi Eddington luminosity are quite important because they can give us sort of a gauge on what appropriate time scales are. But also we can figure out things like the maximum luminous mass a black hole can be. Before we go a bit further, though, we should actually mention briefly the role of spin uh, within actual accretion itself, because it does play quite a big role. So black holes are actually only characterized by their mass and their angular momentum uh, in the real world. They can also be characterized by their charge. But in reality, these charges tend to neutralize. And so it's not really a big sort of factor that we need to consider when it comes to observing and making any calculations. Although, I don't know, I might be wrong in 10 years time, we might find out that's completely 
completely wrong. Most people will know of the Schwarzschild black hole, and that is essentially a stationary black hole. It's only got mass, has no charge and no angular momentum, so it's not actually spinning or, you know, rotating. And the Schwarzschild radius, I'll actually put it up over here somewhere, is this very nice and simple equation here where we've got the r, that's the Schwarzschild radius, is equal to 2gm over c squared, where m is the mass of the black hole and c squared is, you know, the speed of light. g is also the gravitational constant. This uh, formula, very simply, is explain it tells us the radius of a stationary black hole, but it is also a fairly useful assumption for very low spinning black holes as well. But we'll touch on that in a second. Um, it's also a solution of the Schwarzschild metric as well, so that's how we're able to derive it. While it is, you know, as I've said, a solution of the Schwarzschild metric, from a more classical sort of Newtonian standpoint, we can actually think of this radius as the radius at which something orbiting would need the speed of light in order to actually escape. So the escape velocity would be the speed of light at the Schwarzschild radius. And so it's also the event horizon. <laughs> so in real life, we actually expect things to spin to some varying degree. So the Schwarzschild radius provides us with a nice approximation, especially if things aren't spinning that much. However, you know, if things are spinning, it's it's really important that we actually do include that, especially when the effects of spin are, you know, non-negligible. In this case, rather than actually talking regarding the Schwarzschild radius, uh, a lot of scientists actually talk about um, size with regards to the ISCO, that's the innermost stable circular orbit. And I feel like it says, <laughs> it essentially says what it is. It's the smallest radius at which something can orbit in a you know, a stable circular orbit. For, you know, like an accretion disk, for, exam for example, that will be the smallest radius that you see, the inner radius of the accretion disk. So in order to actually figure out what this ISCO would be, we actually have to use the Kerr metric, which is <laughs> a big step up from the Schwarzschild metric. I'll pop it on over there, but you don't actually need to really understand it or know it for the purposes of this video. I'm just going to pop it up there to scare you, really. So don't worry about all of like the, the sigmas and whatnot. Just look at the A. We're going to look at the A parameter over here, which is the spin parameter. And it is defined as the angular momentum divided by the mass of the black hole times the speed of light. So um, in the case of accretion disks around a black hole, it's quite useful, and it goes from minus one to one, where one is maximum prograde motion. So in the case of an accretion disk, it would be the accretion disk is spinning with the black hole, and minus one would be retrograde motion. So the accretion disk is spinning, spinning opposite to the black hole, but I can't. Well, can't do it with my hands, but you get the picture. And then zero, of course, is a stationary black hole. So I won't go about actually solving these for the ISCO in this video. I I don't think anybody would want to see that. Um, but I'll just show you that um, for the different, the three different cases that I've just talked about, for the stationary solution, we can see that the ISCO is roughly three times the Schwarzschild radius. And then for the maximum prograde um, motion case, we've got the ISCO being I think it's half the Schwarzschild radius, and then for the retrograde motion, I think it's 4.5 times the Schwarzschild radius. So you can see actually with a retrograde, the retrograde, the retrograde case, you can see that the actual accretion disk itself has to be quite far away from the black hole compared to the prograde case, where you can get really close in. Now, what's really important here is to think about how this spin parameter actually translates to the efficiency of the, you know, the separation of the gravitational energy and, you know, essentially how well a black hole can grow. So it's quite important here that we find a way of connecting this spin parameter to the efficiency of, you know, black hole accretion, because essentially this is what we want to sort of figure out. How do black holes grow and what would be the most efficient case here? And the, the answer would actually surprise you, but <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. So we can actually, instead of writing the radius of the ISCO as just, you know, a certain number times the Schwarzschild radius, we can represent it with the letter Z um, times GM over C squared, uh, where the equation for Z 
which we get from A is this thing over here. We can also relate the efficiency to Z, which I will actually, I'll pop up the equation there, but I'll also give you a table to my side, hopefully you can see that, which relates um, the efficiency to Z, and also I've put the A numbers there as well. And what's interesting, you can actually see that when A equals one, we've got the prograde case, Z is equal to one, and eta is actually the 0 0.422, so the efficiency is 42.2%. You can then see with the Schwarzschild case, we've got A equals zero, Z equals six, and then eta equals 0 0.057, and then for the retrograde case, we've got eta equals 0 0.038, which is the lowest efficiency it can go. I think most supermassive black holes exhibit properties that show that they're mostly, well, most of them are just ever so slightly uh, with prograde motion, which is why we generally assume that the efficiency is 10%. This is quite interesting because I would have personally thought that they would either be completely prograde or completely retrograde motion at first. And the reason I thought this is that when you liberate the, um, when you remove the angular momentum from the accretion disk matter as it's being accreted, you know, you, you can't, that angular momentum has to go somewhere. We've got, we need to conserve it. And so actually what happens is the black hole either spins up or spins down according to either whether it was prograde or retrograde to the black hole itself. So with a prograde disk that's actually moving with the black hole, of course you'd expect it to spin even faster up until the maximum amount. And then for the retrograde case, you could spin it down to the point where it's either, if it's already prograde, it will go stationary, then retrograde, and then it will spin down even further to the maximum amount. But actually what happens is, observationally, we've seen that roughly you get a really good mix of prograde and retrograde stuff falling into the black hole. And so on average, the actual black hole tends to spin down and stay fairly close to stationary. And this is kind of seen with the efficiency that we've, we've seen, the 10%. It actually, it all adds up in a way. And actually, if we think about the growth rate, so the actual change in the mass, the increase in mass over time, uh, I've got this very handy equation over there, which I won't derive for you, but um, it's there for your... Uh, for your knowledge. If we plug in, say, roughly, I think it's 10 to the 9 years, which is what we expect a black hole that's stellar sized, so about 25 solar masses, so 25 times the mass of the sun, to grow to the sizes that we see today, which is roughly 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 billion. No, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses, so hundreds of millions to billions of <laughs> times the mass of the sun, which is humongous we actually see that with, when it comes to the prograde case, um, if we sub in some numbers such as the efficiency and whatnot, um, we get quite a low a low answer where the, um, the growth rate has to be less than, I think it's about 16. So that's definitely not what, according to what we are actually seeing, that's not the right kind of growth rate. Uh, when it comes to a, a roughly stationary case, we expect this to be, I think it's roughly 10 to the 14 this growth rate, which sounds actually about right and more appropriate according to the time scales. And then when in the retrograde case, it we just have a ridiculously large growth rate. So in actuality, although the prograde case has the biggest efficiency, it's the low spin black holes that can grow the fastest here and maintain that you know, that great growth rate that matches up with observations. So in general, just to summarise what we've just talked about, because I've put up quite a few <laughs> equations here, we really do need to consider the conservation of angular momentum. So, uh, for example, a disk that's moving prograde to the black hole will spin it up because it needs to, we need to conserve that angular momentum within this system. So as the disk loses angular momentum, the black hole actually gains it, and so it spins up. And if the disk is retrograde, it will spin down the black hole. In this case, what it means is that, of course, if we just keep spinning up the black hole, yes, we see that this efficiency does increase, but that's not all that important because it can't actually grow at the same rate. The growth rate will actually slow down. But observationally, we do see a healthy mix of retrograde and prograde motion, which actually keeps the black hole itself not stationary, but just slightly prograde or just slightly retrograde here. This gets complicated by the disk shape, such as warps and tilts, which we see present in quite a lot of disks, but we won't go into that into 
for now, for the purposes of this video, it will just get too complex. Right, let's talk about merging supermassive black holes. Merging refers to, very simply, two supermassive black holes merging into one much larger one. We see plenty and plenty of galaxies that are just about to collide and merge together, and those that we think might have actually been mergers in the past and are now very oddly shaped galaxies such as Hoag's object or other ring galaxies. The time scale for supermassive black hole mergers, which I'll just call mergers from now on, is humongous. We're talking millions of years, even more than that potentially. It's on time scales that we as humans will never observe, and it probably actually explains why we see so many mergers at various stages as well. So there are a couple key parts of the merging process itself that I want to talk about. The first bit is the orbital decay phase. So when these two mergers are orbiting each other, we've got we <laughs> we've got two massive accelerating objects. And so what actually happens is their orbits decay and they get closer together, so their separation decreases. And so as they're in spiraling together, gravitational waves actually carry out quite a lot of energy from the orbits themselves. And so that's essentially why they in spiral. Next up, we actually get the merging itself where they actually touch each other and combine. And then after that, we have a little phase called the ring down. Now, I'm actually not too sure as to the specifics of this, but this is essentially where the new black hole has a little ring. The newly formed supermassive black hole experiences a recoil kick and essentially, you know, gets kicked out of the system, but it actually takes the accretion disk and nearby matter with it. This is because the viscous time scale uh, for the disk is roughly the same as the time to escape the galaxy itself. So this is why when we experience sea mergers, we don't actually see any naked supermassive black holes. It actually carries things with it. Now, we've actually talked about these two things separately, but it's quite interesting to talk about uh, when these things actually, these two methods actually, you know, come together. So, for example, when we get a supermassive black hole binary, which will, you know, eventually merge, but also what the accretion disk does around it. So if both the supermassive black holes are roughly of the same size, we expect that the accretion disk matter, you know, gets captured by both of them fairly equally. But if one is significantly larger than the other, then the very large one basically eats up all of the accretive matter. The little one doesn't really get anything. <laughs> so I've got a little handy diagram of a very elliptical orbit with two supermassive black holes. And what's important is that we get the inter a lot of interactions between the two and the disk. And these interactions are strongest at the apocenter or the apoapsis, I think, which is the furthest point away. So regardless of how many interactions and kicks you give the system, the apocenter here is actually fixed. And as you lose angular momentum, what actually happens is the eccentricity decreases and the periapsis actually gets smaller, so gets closer to the main black hole. Oh, I should note that this is for retrograde motion, so the accretion disk is moving retrograde to the binary's orbit. Just need to let you know that. So higher eccentricity means that you get a closer pericenter, which means that the uh, separation gets small enough eventually so that the merging can actually begin. I did mention that this is all for the retrograde case. In the prograde case, um, because everything is moving in the same direction, you actually have the risk of getting resonance resonances which actually prevent interactions from occurring. That is all I have to talk about how supermassive black holes grow. Uh, so we've discussed that the, there are two main methods for supermassive black holes to grow. We've got accreting matter through an accretion disk and also merging. And we've also discussed a little bit about when merging happens and how the accretion disk can play a little role in that as well. So it's quite a nice little conclusion at the end. Thank you very much for joining me and I'll see you soon.